with us today. Um, are we on? Because all, all, all kinds of weird hand signals going on out there. All right. Um, but so pleased to have you and uh, in our Bible study on Wednesday nights, the Bible. In the light of our redemption, using the study course by E.W. Kenyon, again, available um, by Amazon.com, Walmart.com, and uh, I would encourage you to pick that up. And I do believe there is an electronic form you can purchase if you want that that way. Um, but um, go on, get in our lesson. We've got 30, it's 37 lessons. We're on lesson 11. It would be worth your investment to get it, catch up, and be part of what we're doing here. Praise the Lord. And so we welcome you to our study. Last week, we talked about the deliverance from Egypt, talked about the plagues, Israel being brought out. Uh, God remembered his covenant with Israel. And uh, now we're moving into um, the covenant people in the wilderness. I need to check real quick. Or we, do we have audio? Okay. All right. Just double checking. I wasn't sure what this. We sit got a new setup, new mic setup, and um, I wasn't sure what the light meant. I wanted to confirm that we're um, we're playing and figuring it out as we go. Hallelujah! All right, um, we are talking again about the covenant keeping God. He's brought Israel out of Egypt, and um, He's delivered them from that. Reaffirming his past, his covenant through the Passover, and um, and then they then they end up going into the wilderness and facing the perils of the wilderness, uh, and God, the covenant keeping God, keeps with them throughout that. Now, um, the instruction in the Passover rite of Jehovah's blood friendship with Israel is to become a permanent ceremonial um, event among them as a memorial of their miraculous deliverance from Egypt. God's covenant people, praise the Lord. Uh, the Passover uh, typifies Christ on the cross. The lamb had to be a male without blemish. He had to be on the, taken on the 10th day of the month in the Jewish calendar. Uh, kept until the 14th day, and he was slain at even, uh, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Christ was betrayed on the 10th day, crucified on the 14th, died at 3 o'clock, Obviously, all this symbolic and, and typology of the coming Christ. Hallelujah. Exodus 13, 9 declares, It shall be for you to assign upon thee, uh, upon thy hand and for the memorial between thine eyes that the law of Jehovah may be um, in thy mouth. For a strong hand hath Jehovah, Jehovah brought you or thee out of Egypt. Now, they were... Um, Would do is wear a frontlet, what they call a frontlet. It was a leather pouch that they could wear it around their head and above their eyes or on their wrist. And in there, they would have a scripture um, that the word was ever before them or with them. Okay. Uh, and um, so they they did this as part of a, like the blood covenant ritual. Um, the Jews have been accustomed to wearing these, um, what they call it, the frontlet. And um, it, it contained a record of the Passover between Jehovah and the seed of Abraham, his blood covenant friend. Okay. Now, before the um, challenge to Pharaoh and the conflict with Pharaoh began, God said to Moses um, over in Exodus 3, I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and of uh, her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver, and jewels of gold, and raiment, and that you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall um, despoil the Egyptians. Now, King talks about how here that the Hebrew word um, where they, King James translates, you will borrow from your neighbor. Um, And the the, the uh, Egyptians lent them the uh, the jewels. Um, the words there in Hebrew are have a different bearing or different meaning than um, than we would translate in English. 
Um, the Hebrew word ask is rendered borrow. It's, it's really ask. Ask of your neighbor, not borrow. Um, in other words, King James kind of lends the thought that possibly um, God told them to go borrow it, but you're never going to return it. Well, that's not really borrowing it. And yet the, the words of the Hebrew are ask and to, um, to uh, let ask. In other words, they willingly gave that to them. It's like, get out of our country. We will gladly give you this stuff. Okay? All right. So, the covenant God intervened. He gave the people favor, the eyes of the Egyptians. They were looked upon by their enemies in a new light. And the Egyptians gave it unto them. These were the spoils of the most glorious victory than any conquering nation had ever known. Um, they conquered, they, uh, in history, the conquered had been spoiled, but never willingly. Here the Egyptians find joy in giving that to those who had mastered them. I mean, it's like, yes, we'll give this to you. We'll give you everything. Um, the covenant people who had simply stood by and waited for salvation from their God of the covenant pass out adorned um, with the gorgeous raiment of the jewels of those with whom for so long had spoiled them. More than 200 years before, their covenant God had predicted this triumph. In Genesis 15, 13 through 14, he said to Abraham that his seed should be a stranger and afflicted in his not theirs, and that he would judge the nation whom they served. With it, he had given this promise. Afterward, shall they come out with great substance. Hallelujah. Here God looked forward to the very spoiling of the Egyptians as the end of the sore travail of his people with a compensation for their bondage and slavery. Now, real quickly, there are a lot of people who try to preach and teach and use this metaphorically for people um, who've been held in slavery in the past that God's going to, you know, make them rich. But see, this was God's covenant people. You can't, allegories and types are allegories and types, and you can't make them fit into every circumstance. There have been people's editions around the world throughout history that have been held captive, captive and slaves to other people and did not come out and have this, this kind of deliverance and all the spoils and stuff uh, because they weren't God's covenant people. Okay? Um, so to make that, try to go back and take this and make it apply to something that it does not apply to is, is bad Bible, number one. I mean, it's bad theology. Um, accurate. This was specific. They went in um, willingly, were taken over later because of jealousy. They were still already God's covenant people when they went in. And so, uh, and God had blessed the nation by bringing them in. And then because they had been blessed by him and they, and they turned on his covenant people, then they were rewarded with all the spoil. Uh, to try to make this fit other scenarios in history or modern, modern day history is just inaccurate. Okay? Forget it. It don't work. Because they were before that time, God's covenant people. Many people have been held captive who were not covenant people who were never in covenant with God, who were rebellious toward God, whose, whose, whose worship and religions were false gods. So you can't make it apply here. It, it just doesn't work. And I think I, I just want to throw that in because I've heard people teach this and try to say, well, you know, this God's going to give you this, and God's going to give you that because here's the type, but you, you've got it. You can't use it as a type there. It doesn't fit the, it doesn't fit the narrative. Um, it just doesn't. Here God had looked forward to the very spoiling of the Egyptians as the end of sore travail of his people and the compensation for their bondage and slavery. But not just a compensation for their bondage and slavery. It was compensation for the bondage and slavery in a land that they had been brought into willingly, that they had been invited into, that they had blessed, that their their presence there had caused, uh, caused great multiplication and had entered into the land as the covenant people of God to begin with. And then not stop being God's covenant people that whole time. 
All right. So God's brought them out. Now, so on the second day, I just I just had to throw that in there. Um, you just can't take something that sounds good, and because somebody preaches it and makes it, you know, hypes it up, and you know, and I mean, says it with fervor and whatever. If it's not biblically accurate, it just ain't biblically accurate. So you can't go out and start saying, "Oh yeah, God's going to do this." I mean, I look on mean, you know, whoever whoever uh, sees this today is going to be rich tomorrow on Facebook. You know, I got a word. Nobody's ever going to have any more trouble. <clears throat> I see all kinds of things that float out there. You know, if you pass this on, you're going to experience great wealth. If not, you're in trouble. I don't do any of that because me passing on your little meme or not doesn't mean anything. That's not biblical. It doesn't ha doesn't affect me. Just because somebody says it and says it with authority or says it in, you know, the father showed me or God showed me doesn't mean he did. I need some claps or some holy grunts or something out there. I mean, like, help me, Jesus, as would work. Let's go. All right. So on the second day of the journey, the Israelites followed the, the usual route to Palestine. Um, and, and it led them by or to the edge of the wilderness and across those sands up along the Mediterranean coast by the nearest way to Palestine. A few marches onward, and they would have passed into the territory of the warlike Philistines. Um, but all of a sudden, God changes the route. He led not, not through the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. In other words, they bring them in there. These people are fighting. They're warriors or soldiers. They're trying to kill people. And we come in, and they see that. We better, it'd be just better to go back to Egypt. He didn't want them to change their mind. I want to go back to Egypt because of what they saw there. So he said, let's do something different. Um, but he led the people about through a way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. Why then, you may ask, uh, were they suffered to make a beginning which looked as if they were about to take the more expeditious route, um, road to the land of promise of their fathers? Why was a change made in the route so that they could, uh, so that they had on the third to retrace their steps and march southward to the Egyptian side of the sea? And it may be a very perplexing question, and it does look as if God's plan had been suddenly altered. Uh, but what you need, with some reflection, you can see the divine wisdom. The whole is explained in the words, they encamped on the edge of the wilderness. God had a twofold purpose. Israel had to bend to the divine will. In other words, must obey the, him without question, even if it didn't make sense. See, faith obeys even if it doesn't make sense. Faith obeys even if it doesn't make sense. Okay? Faith is obedience. God told Abraham, get thee out of that country, out of thy father's house, and go into a place that I will show you. God could have told him, hey, look, I'm going to send you down here um, to, to, you know, whatever Israel was called at the time, whatever that land was called, Canaan. I'm, I'm sitting down in Canaan. You're going south, you know, 300 miles, uh, turn left 150 miles, and then south again for 50 miles, and you're there. He could have told him that, but he didn't. He told him, get up, pack up, head out, and I'll tell you where you're going. So following the plan of God without question is a matter of faith. Hallelujah. Naturally, they were at the, at the offset. Went to the, who wants, I mean, one of the shortest route. You've been in captivity 400 years. God tells you, we're going over here. I got a land for you. Here's the straightest routes here. It's two days, two and a half days. Boom, you're there. Except he gets there a second day, turns around, backtracks a whole day, and moves down around. Um, and you got, if you're, um, like some people I know want to know why to everything. Why'd you go this way? Why'd you turn here? Why'd you turn there? Why are you going this speed? Why aren't you going that speed? <laughs> I'm picking up my wife right now. You know, <clears throat> um, why are you stopping so far from the light? Why aren't you stopping? You're too close to the light. <laughs> Uh, 
Lights turn green. Why did you go? Light turns green. Why did you go so fast? <laughs> and I just go. <laughs> oh, um, I could keep going. <laughs> it gets humorous sometimes. It gets humorous sometimes. <coughs> Hallelujah. But if you're, if you, you know, yeah, y'all stop it. All right. But if you know, you're like, why are we, why are we doing this? It's right over there. Why are we going up? But God said, go about this way. Why? Because God said so. <clears throat> yeah, that doesn't make any sense. It's right over there. Doesn't matter. God said so. Okay? Um, he let them go as, as far as they he, uh, he, he could let them go based on what they wanted to do. And this and no, let's go this way. They were brought to the edge of the wilderness, and here comes the reflection. There's nothing inviting in the aspect of the dreary expanse. They, he began to think of the plodding, thirsting, hunger, tire, treeless, waterless, habitationless desert. They could think of the embattled wall of fierce, determined foreman through which the way must be forced after the desert had been tra traversed. There was no murmuring on the morrow when God said, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn back. This brought relief to them. The covenant God also had another purpose. The king was carefully watching their movements. That's Pharaoh. God was not going to allow his covenant people to pass with dishonor from the land of Egypt. They were not going to be allowed to run away. You know, in other words, go face the armies of the Philistines and run. That would be dishonorable for God to have brought them out. Then them run from battle with the Philistines. Because they're not warriors. They're not trained. They're, they've been... You know, slaves, brick makers for hundreds of years. So they're not even, you know, weaponry. They don't they don't know any of this. When the covenant of God delivers, it's not through human methods. His deliverance is glorious in its fullness and its beauty of holiness. Egypt will thrust herself out and compel them to abandon the country, so the route was changed. The Egyptians are left in their selfish greed and cruelty to misread the change to their own destruction. Yeah. They say, oh, they made a mistake. Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. In other words, he sees a strategic mistake by their generals, by God, in the move that they made. It seemed to be a, a sudden Example of unexpected weakness. Apparently, they could think there's no God among them anymore. He's left them. He's departed from them. And Egypt can now enjoy to the full the wild revenge for which it panted. And so they said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. The thought that had sprung up in Pharaoh's bosom seems to be flamed up like an like an answering fire in the bosom of his people. The heart of Pharaoh and of his servants were turned against the people, and they said, What is this we have done? We have let Israel go from serving us. Now, just, just three days before, they're giving them stuff, saying, Leave. Yeah, here you go. Uh, Ethel, is that gold around your neck? Here. Take Ethel's gold jewelry, won't you? Please take it. Here, oh, pop the earrings off. I mean, they were just giving and telling them to get out of there. It seems that all the troops they could amass together took part in this pursuit. The eloquent display, uh, discipline, and standing army of Egypt is one of the marvels of the ancient world. You can imagine what terror must have laid upon the hearts of the Israelites the moment they realized that fearful engine, the sound of the chariots and the horses, was being directed toward them. Listen, this is not the greatest faith bunch you've ever met. Okay? Okay? And we see that uh, numerous times and during this, this stage. It seems for a moment in the mad, hopeless despair, despair, they forgot God of the covenant. They cry bitterly unto Moses for bringing them into this place of seeming death. And then we hear the words of faith from Moses uh, and to fear not because a covenant God will work on their behalf this day. Remember? Stand ye still 
and see. Ye shall not need to fight this battle. Stand ye still and see the salvation of God. Hallelujah. You're all uptight. Watch this. Speak unto the people of Israel that they go forward. Then he, this covenant God, was bidden to prepare a, a strange pathway for them. Moses was to lift up the rod which had uh, brought judgment upon the Egyptians. That same rod was going to uh, command the forces of nature to work salvation, deliverance for the people of the covenant. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord's caused the sea to go back by a strong wind all that night. And may the sea dry land, and the waters were divided, and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on the right hand and on the left. Now, I've got to say, because I like using uh, uh, the Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille uh, as a reference point a lot, the splitting of the Red Sea I don't think they still, even with um, CGI, have done it better than what he did in the 1958 version uh, of that movie. It was amazing. If you, you've you seen it, and you've seen it, you haven't seen it, right? Get that boy that movie. He needs to see it. Hallelujah. You need to see it. <laughs> it is amazing. I mean, it's amazing, especially considering the fact they didn't have CGI. Um, the forces of nature obey the word of the covenant man. As we all stand in the presence of this tremendous miracle, we catch a glimpse into the far past at the time when uh, the first man walked in the realm of God's ability with dominion over the works of his hands, the dominion that was lost at the fall. We see glimpses of it now. And then under the co old covenant, at such an instance as this, until the time comes when the second Adam walks one with the Father, the, the dominion over the forces of nature. Glory to God. So they're, you know, strategically, they're brought around with no escape route. They're brought to the edge of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army comes in behind them. They're cut off. There is no escape route. For, for a warrior, for, for uh, the, the Egyptians, they could you know, easily pounce upon them as prey and uh, emaciate them and take control of them again. And there's no power in the natural for them to do anything about it. And there's nowhere to flee. There's no, there's no strategic highland. There's nothing they can do. But God says, stretch forth your rod. Causes the east wind to blow by the night. Divides the water, and it's a wall on one side and a wall on the other. And the, some theologian back about 50 years ago in some uh, theological cemetery, um, and I won't even correct it to a seminary, it was a theological cemetery, uh, stated it was no big deal. The, the water was only six inches deep where they crossed over. And first time I heard Dad Hagen preach along those lines, he said, he, as soon as he said that, he said, what? Glory to God. God drowned the whole Egyptian army, horses and all, in six inches of water. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> see, when you try to be stupid and look smart while you're doing it, uh, and when you are stupid but try to look smart while you're being stupid, <clears throat> you say stupid things. Hallelujah. Um, in the previous lesson, man can actually could um, no man could actually be born again by the Spirit of God. In other words, until God had the legal right to impart spiritual life into man, he could not be born again. He was spiritually dead. God did not have a legal right to impart life to those covenant people. Were still waiting for Messiah to come. The natural man is limited by his knowledge to that which he gains from the physical senses. God would have to manifest to Israel in the realm they could understand. His presence can be known to them only by their physical senses. And he made his presence known to them as a pillar of fire. 
or a cloud that appeared on the second day. They could see the cloud, hear and feel the warmth of the fiery cloud in the nighttime. The pillar of cloud was not only a visible manifestation of his presence, but a means of caring for them. Um, it became a protection during the daytime, as we say, we talked about, I think, last week, how the cloud would, would cover them from the intense heat of the sun. And then at night, because of the because of the uh, radiational cooling, and uh, it, the, the heat just rapidly escaping back out into the atmosphere, because because of the you know the desert and uh, the, the way the desert is, temperatures would drop drastically. It was a pillar of fire, and so it gave them warmth. It kept them at a moderated or even temperature. This this and was also. A protection to them against the armies of, of Egypt. Um, so that when the cloud moved, they knew when to move. When it didn't move, they, they would set up camp and, until it moved again. Uh, it was a comfort. It was a guide. Uh, it was a protection. For the 40 years, they were in the desert. Now, the Egyptians came to pursue them. They had gotten to the Red Sea, could not go over. The Egyptian was coming up on them. The, the cloud moved from before them. And came, as the Bible says, stood behind them. So in between the camp of the Egyptians and the Israelites, the cloud was there. To the Egyptians, it was just a dark something they, that they, you know, as being superstitious, didn't know what to do with. But on the other side, it was light and warmth. Hallelujah. Thick darkness to the Egyptians, light and warmth to the Israelites. I remember something Dr. Thompson said a number of years ago. He said, don't get slapped with the backhand of the anointing. The anointing of God can be blessing to his people and a curse to those who come against them. In other words, you can get hit by the anointing and get slapped pretty hard. And whenever big, he's just alive. He's just, oh, be a better Bible student than just quoting stuff that somebody puts on Facebook on a little meme. God's love does things sometimes in order to turn people to him that otherwise resist him or to protect his covenant people. Don't believe it? Ask Paul. Paul was on the road to Damascus when Jesus showed up and knocked him off that horse. It was not a social visit. It was get saved to go to hell visit. I'm telling you, it was. that's exactly what it was. Jesus showed up to stop Saul. And it was going to stop one way or the other. You're going to turn and serve God or you're out of here. I mean, you're, you're, this, is your, this is the last day you'll do this. Boom. Herod took the glory and, and was smitten by the angel and the worms ate him from the inside out. That just didn't sound like a good way to go. I don't think. Hello. So you, you, we create narratives that we can't we can't biblically sustain when you take them to extremes. Um. So the march through the desert. Now that eventful period in Israel's history begins the march of the desert. The peninsula of Sinai is to this day kind of no man's land. Other regions have been covered and fought for. No powers of earth uh, of either ancient or modern times have ever sought for possession of Sinai. This isolated, despised district, three million slaves are taken. They have a slave spirit. They're untrained, full of criticism and bitterness. In this, this place, the covenant God is going to reveal himself in his glory and build from this slave nation a free people with the leaders and teachers. They're separated from idolatry. The nation has... That is to preserve the revelation of the true God will learn to walk dependent upon him. We start with Israel's Israel on this momentous journey. As we study it, we find that there are, there are lessons for us to learn. The third day of the journey, they arrive at Moriah where the waters were bitter. They had been used to drinking the sweet water of the Nile. It was feigned throughout the east. And now in childish disappointment, they burst forth in childish, unrestrained complaint against Moses. Now, I, I remember as a kid, 
uh, lived in Florida for about a year and a half. Maybe not quite a year and a half. Um, anyway, lived in Florida um, from um, the end of third grade until just into the beginning of the fifth grade. And we moved. We moved back to North Carolina. And we had to, uh, when, until you, unless you had a water filtration system purifier put on your house, you had to drink bottled water because the water a lot of times would smell of sulfury, rotten eggs. And, uh, and that's, that's what I call bitter water. Now, it was considered consumable, but you really didn't want to consume it. When you stick it up to your nose and it stinks like that, it just, it just does something to you. I don't know if you can imagine. If you've ever been around that, you know what I'm talking about. And um, so we had we had a, we had bottled water in the house, and I don't think they ever did get a water purification system or filtration system um, back then. That was a quick fix. Um, but they got here and got bitter water, and they're going to complain. They're a whiny bunch. See, sometimes God's got to take a whiny bunch and make them a a bold bunch. Amen. Um. He even cares for them here. He turns the remember Moses had to take the stick and throw it in the waters, and it became sweet. He manifests himself to them not only as the one who shall lead them, care for them, protect them, but as the one who in Exodus uh, fifteen not permit the, the, permit the diseases to come upon them that has been brought upon the Egyptians, because he's the Lord their healer. In the blood covenant rights and privileges, all that he was belonged to Israel. His ability belonged to them. His care, his protection, his healing were theirs. It's remarkable that during this wilderness period, while they walked in the covenant, no babies, no children, no young men or women died. No one died prematurely because of the power of disease. He was the covenant God who healed them. Now young, everyone under 20. Now remember, the reason that they wandered for 40 years was when they did get to Jordan, they sent spies over into the land. They came back. The 12 spies came back. 10 came back with an evil report. And two, and two came back with a good report. God could not bring that much unbelief into the land of promise. And their unbelief kept them out. And so for the next 40 years, they rehearse over and over and over again. And I can imagine the older people as they get older and the younger people getting, you know, moving up in age. Those, by the time they go in, those who are around 20 were close to 60. And they heard their parents who had died. The older people had all died off. Everyone above the age of 20, except Caleb and Joshua. Or uh, dad used to say Joshua hallelujah, um, died. And I can imagine they said, we made a mistake. We missed it. <clears throat> the God that you see and keep your clothes from wearing out, the God's been a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, the God who's fed us quail and manna in the desert. You know, he taught us the ways of faith. We, we missed it. We rejected it. And because of that, we don't get to enter in. But when he says, go, do not question, do not you know, um, flinch, pack up, and go as hard as you can go because God, that, that God will be with you going into the land. I, I just can, I can hear him sitting down at the dinner table rehearsing <clears throat> how they were brought up out of Egypt, how God had done supernaturally, how God had brought them across the Red Sea, and yet they still acted in unbelief when it was time to go possess the land. And because of that, they weren't allowed, they weren't permitted to possess it. But you are the next generation, and God's going to use you to take the land, and you go up at once. You be like Joshua and Caleb. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able. I believe that was rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. They were taught to be a, a generation of faith. Hallelujah. And we cannot draw back. Many of you out there <clears throat> who are watching came up in a generation of faith. We've been taught faith, lived faith, talked faith, done faith, 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 faith. 
and now we've got people trying to come along and you know they want to they want to start watering it down they sort of want to you know get weak in faith we cannot be weak in faith we must in this day in this hour we must be strong in faith giving glory to god amen um <clears throat> To our questions, Kenyon states, says, tell the Passover rite as it was to exist as a memorial upon the Israelites. And your answer is, it was to become a permanent ceremonial memorial among, a, a, a ceremonial among them as a memorial to their miraculous deliverance from Egypt as the covenant people of God. And explain Exodus 12, 35 and 36. The Hebrew word borrow means to ask. The word translated lend means to let ask. And, and that is to entertain a request and graciously to give. It was not a case of theft, a case of borrowing with no thought of return. It was they asked for it and they were granted it joyfully. Um. What lost authority of man was manifest at the crossing of the Red Sea? The lost authority manifested was that of the dominion of man over the works of God's hands. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and over all the works of my hands. God had given man dominion, which he had lost and sold out to Satan at the fall. Why did God have to visibly manifest himself to is verse number four um to israel in, as in the pillar of uh, of cloud because they could he could only manifest himself to them through their physical senses because they were not born again they had to he had to reveal himself to them naturally in natural means prove himself naturally um so he could manifest himself what needs did the pillar of cloud meet? Well, it was protection, comfort, and a guide. It was protection. Remember, we went behind them and kept them from um, kept them from the Egyptians. It was comfort. It, it kept them physically comfortable from the elements, and it guided them. It would move and say, "It's time to move." If it moved, you had to move with the cloud. I mean, they had to break camp and take off. I mean, you know. Can you imagine getting up in the morning, going outside, stretching, rubbing your eyes, and the clouds moving? Ethel, get up, pack up, we gotta go. Now, there won't no sleeping in. Okay, if you're lazy to slip in, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're left behind. Um, describe the, uh, number six, describe the land into which God led his covenant children when they left Egypt. The peninsula of Sinai is a no man's land. It's desert. It's despised and isolated. And why were the covenant people of God led to this place? They were led there in order for God to take a slave nation and make it a free nation. Let me say something. One of the things we know um, about any type of slavery or bondage or, or, or um, What's the word I'm looking for? Authoritarian, authoritarian rule over people for a long period of time is it beats people down. It breaks their will. Um, when, when the Civil War ended and all slaves were declared free men, history tells us of many, many, many places where the slaves stayed on the plantations. They did not know where to go. They didn't know what to do. Why? The, all they knew, all they knew was, was living on, living there. They grew up there. They lived on those, they lived on that plantation. They worked it. They had no idea. They had no, nothing to measure being free against. They didn't know what it meant to be free. So even though legally they were declared free, and physically, they could leave and go do what they wanted to do. In their their thinking, they were still captive. They didn't know how to act. They didn't know what to do. And um, you know, much as you know, we, we we see that 
You know, I, I, I got right now people, people don't have to wear a mask outside. But over after almost a year and a half of everybody having to wear a mask, people walk around outside with masks on. Like they must. They're, they've got that mindset. They, you begin to develop a certain mindset that the control of something has had on you for so long that it governs the way you think. It governs the way you act. It governs the way you conduct yourself. Okay? And so the, the, Israel, the Israelites have been slaves for so many years that they, even though were free, they were still in their thinking a slave people. And God had to break that thinking out of them and make them a free people in their minds and hearts. Amen. And I won't go off on any kind of rant right now on a soapbox about what's going on with COVID. Other than, trust me, it's got a whole lot more to do than COVID. It's about control. And I'll leave it right there. Um, so God was going to make them a free nation with leaders and teachers. It is the place they were separated from idolatry. He would preserve the revelation of the true God and they would learn to walk in a dependency upon him. What took place at Moriah? Well, that's where Israel, where they were accustomed to drinking the, what, what many people call the sweet waters of the Nile. And when they got to Moriah, they found bitter water. And they complained and murmured, and God turned the waters sweet. Hallelujah. And then explain Exodus 15, 26 through 27. It is in this place that God reveals himself as Jehovah Rapha, the covenant God who heals, the God that healeth thee, making healing part of his covenant relationship with them. And then the last one is, what has the knowledge of blood covenant meant to you? And that's, that's going to be, what does the revelation or the knowledge of the blood covenant mean to you? What does it mean to you as a, as a believer? Um, and, and those answers could vary. And if we were meeting here in person, we'd probably ask you to tell us what you think. But um, what did it mean to you? What does it, that knowledge mean to you? And that to me, it personally means that I'm in a relationship with God who keeps covenant. It's sealed, ratified, and established in blood. He is not a covenant breaker. And because, it's, because our covenant now is through the blood of Jesus it's an everlasting covenant where he's entered in once and for all with his own blood to obtain eternal redemption for us. Hallelujah. And that it cannot be broken by any man <clears throat> because the covenant was made between the, uh, the man, Christ Jesus, and I entered into it by being born again and becoming in Christ. I enter into that blood covenant relationship forever. Glory to God. Amen and amen. And can somebody say Shandai, S-H-A-N-D-A-I. Next week, we're going to get into the law of the tabernacle. <clears throat> this becomes important because um, in retraining Israel and their thinking, uh, there's still a lot to do. And the fact that they are a, they're a, a bondaged people, they react to things out of a bondage mindset of unbelief. God ends up bringing the law and the tabernacle um, and to drive into them this, this constant, constant, constant. This is what I demand that you can't achieve. This is what I demand. Remember, the law was given to bring us to Christ. It was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. Hallelujah. Not to get cocky and think, oh, we can do this ourselves. God was not going to let the people of Israel suffer as slaves, come out, and then get cocky and think, hey, look how great we are. He would receive all the glory. And the things he demanded, they would not be able to achieve in their own ability. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want to give you an update. Um, for those of y'all that were on Sunday, we received that special offering um, to uh, help buy a service dog 
for a student at our school and they're in need of a service dog. It's a special, it's a special deal. Um, they normally cost twenty thousand dollars. <throat> they're able to acquire a, a certain kind of dog that's, that's trainable for eighteen hundred. And um, the school, you know, uh, our church um, <coughs> ended up giving a thousand dollars. We um, in the offerings, I told you, saying we had four seventy. Since then, more's come in. We, we the um, the um, offerings came in uh, totaled up to eight hundred and forty dollars. And then the church added to it to make it an even thousand. So eight hundred and forty dollars came in from you guys. You're awesome. We appreciate you. We appreciate your heart. And so the, the, our, I think our final count now is eight hundred and forty dollars. We gave them a thousand, and uh, the student actually came and found me. We didn't know who it was at the time. They came and said, "Thank you for your what your church did for me. It means a lot." So I got to find out who it was. Um, we, I, they did tell me we, that was kind of a secret thing, but that student wanted to thank me. Uh, and they had Janie for a teacher at one, you know, one time. They knew me from uh, one of the clubs that I oversaw. And um, we blessed them. They were supposed to be able to pick the dog up this weekend. They were almost to the 1800 uh, Obviously, the 1000 meant a whole lot to that, that um, collection to get there. Praise the Lord. And um, our, uh, our staff got to see how, well, how, how wonderful you guys are. You guys are awesome. I just say y'all are awesome. Man, what a privilege to pastor people like you. You guys just make it worth it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We're going to give you these verses, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. We will see you this coming Sunday here at Faith and Victory Church meeting at, uh, at, at uh, New Life Family Church's facility at 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. Come join us there. We love you. God bless you. See you then. Walk in the blessings of the Lord and enjoy your, your Veterans Day. Thank a veteran for their service to, the, to our, our nation. Um, if you see them in public tomorrow with their hats on and whatever, you know, their military, whatever, go out and, just, and say thank you. Thank you for your service. And um, we'll see you guys on Sunday. Love you. God bless you. Have a great evening.